If you're wondering why BMW prices seem to be falling like crazy, or if you're looking at a particular BMW and you're just wondering why it's such a good deal, is it worth the money or is there something hidden? And that brings us to today's question of why are BMWs nowadays so cheap? <clears throat> and I think most of this has to stem from the fact that we enjoyed a very good, I would say last maybe three to four years, uh, maybe even five, depending on when you started looking or when you started entering the car market, whether as a seller or a buyer. But the last few years at the very least have been very, very good to us, mostly because of supply and demand, mostly that there was not a lot of supply, but there was a lot of demand. Um, you know, there was the whole thing with the shutdowns and everything and a pause in production and all of that. And so what we saw was a, you know, a rather drastic boom in the car economy. But now what we've seen, you know, starting around, according to this graph in 2020, at least from Carvana standards, is that things have slowly but surely kind of tapered down to right about to what they normally were because when we look at BMWs in general, not just according to Carvana, um, you know, they do lose their value quite rapidly. This article here is saying that they lose about 23, almost 24% of their value in just the first year. And then some of them 50% over the course of five years. Now, different models, will retain their value or lose their value faster than others. According to this one, the seven series is the one that depreciates the quickest. And I'm not necessarily surprised about that. It's just the fact that it's a larger car. It uses some of the same engine uh, engines as the smaller cars. It uses some of the same suspension components as the other cars. And so when you consider all of that, you're putting more wear on those items on a bigger car. And, you know, because it's a bigger car, you're typically carrying people, you know, you're transporting larger items. So it's not just that there's more wear and tear because of the physicality of the car, but it's also how the car is used throughout its lifespan, you know, versus a two series where it's probably not going to have as many passengers. You're not carrying as many luggages, taking as many people to the airport. So, it's this it's on the opposite end of things where you have a smaller chassis that is using similar components as the as the larger chassis so there's less wear on them because the car physically is smaller the car is physically lighter and it's not being induced all of those stress factors that the larger cars will impose on those same components and so that's just one of the things is that we enjoyed a very good market and now we're kind of coming back to reality. You know, the, the supply has kind of caught up with the demand. And so we're going back to how things were. So if you're somebody who's say 18 to 23, possibly, maybe you weren't really in the car market. So you didn't really experience this. But for those of us who are older, we know what it, typically is for buying and selling cars, especially used cars. And over the last few years, it was like, wow, this, this n never happens. This may never happen again in our lifetime. We should not really expect this to happen again. If we're able to buy a car cheap, or if we had a cheap car and we were able to fix it up really well, we could probably sell it for almost brand new, depending on the mileage on the car and, or we were able to sell it for more than what we got it for all repairs considered. So we are living in a very good time. I think we're still kind of coming out of it depending on where exactly you are in the world. But overall, the car market has been very good to us over the last several years. And it's just now that a lot of people are starting to realize, wow, we're, we're coming back to reality. You know, there was a time when I bought my dad's red F30 about two years ago. And I think when I sold the previous F30, I sold it for, I think I bought the car for about 10,000 and I sold it for 16. And I probably put in 
it's funny because I put in $2,000 in repairs and I was still able to sell some of the parts that I took off of that car for another thousand. So I was really only out 11, sold it for 16. So I made 5,000 profit never happens like to make, you know, a, a 50% margin of return never happens when it comes to buying cars, unless you're buying like classic cars, retro cars, you're doing restorations. And usually for that, it requires a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of knowledge in cars. So um, we're coming out of a time where it used to be that some used cars, because the supply was so low, used cars were going for a higher price than new cars, mostly because they can only mark up the price of a new new car so much. Like they still have to maintain the MSRP, but for used cars, they could sell it for whatever they want. Not really the case anymore. The other part, so the second component as to why BMWs are so cheap is because they are expensive to maintain. You may be able to pick one up for relatively cheap, but has all the maintenance been done on the car? You know, has all the pumps, the hoses, the fluids, has it all been changed and maintained regularly throughout its lifetime? Even if you're picking it up from the very first owner, the thing is, is a lot of the times is those owners may have done the routine maintenance that comes free from the dealership, but there are certain components that they may have never needed to be that have never needed to be replaced, but you will be the one that needs to replace them. And it's because of these high service fees that are involved, especially if you take it to the dealership, that it becomes definitely a, a burden and it becomes, you know, kind of a sticking point for people buying used BMWs. Say for example, we have here uh, the charge pipe. If you're buying the car brand new, you might not want to change the charge pipe right away because the plastic it takes, it can withstand a few heat cycles, not necess not literally a few, but it can handle, you know, a couple tens of thousands of miles of, uh, sorry, it can handle like a few tens of thousands of miles of, of heat cycling. So maybe 20 to 30,000, right? Um, if it's somebody who doesn't really push the car, maybe they get lucky and they can get it all the way to 50 or 60,000. And so maybe the charge pipe is still OEM that will probably break on you. Uh, the oil filter housing gasket, sometimes, you know, typically people will say 30 or 40,000 miles, but again, maybe it was not driven all that much. Maybe it wasn't driven all that hard. Maybe the weather conditions that it was in, maybe it was kept in the garage. The, the gasket itself wasn't exposed to harsh elements. So it doesn't go bad until 60, 70,000 miles. That's it. That's something else that you're gonna have to consider. The make the Mickey Mouse flange, right? Uh, here we can see it's kind of kind of leaking. Here, for those of you who've never seen this before, there is supposed to be um, a, a larger appendage coming out of this to fit into the the engine. And essentially, what happens is because it's plastic, it it snaps off here. Again, all of these things are probably things that the very first owner will never have to deal with. If they buy it, say, for example, on a five-year loan or if they get it on a three-year lease and then they, you know, they upgrade after the end of the term, after the end of the first term, maybe they, you know, they like the G80 versus the F80 or something like that. These are all of the things that you'll have to encounter. And if the BMW dealership, they don't want to fix this hose. They don't want to change this gasket. They're only going to change the charge pipe if it's evident that it's breaking and so if it's the first owner and they're trying to offhand this privately, like these are the things that drive down the price, whether they know it or not. And you going in as the buyer will, will have that negotiating power to say, Hey, these things haven't been done. They do need to be done at some point very, very soon. And so if you're not willing to take these services on, we need to lower the price. And sometimes it's not something as catastrophic as either one of these things, like a major leak, a, a crack in the pipe. It's, it might not be something to this extent, but let's just say the routine things, right? We're talking your water pump. We're talking spark plugs, uh, fuel injectors, uh, ignition coils, O2 sensors, brake pads, rotors, tires, a lot of, th you know, some tires, the all season ones, even the summer ones, if they're not driven all that much might be able to service the life of the car for the very first owner, 
right? Depending on what setup they get, you know, you're talking those those carbon ceramics. Honestly, the carbon ceramics might not even go bad on the second owner, right? Uh, it takes a long time for the carbon ceramics to really wear out. But if we're talking about like the even the end performance brakes, right? The bigger rotors, the bigger pads, cost more money. Uh, if you're gonna do those things, and the brakes have never been serviced, it's a, probably a good bet that the brake fluid has never been serviced as well. So it's probably holding on to a little bit more moisture than it really want than it, than it should, and so you're gonna have to flush that out as well. So that's another cost involved and another negotiating point to bring down the cost of the BMW. And if you're if you're on the opposite end, say for example, you're selling the car, right? And and you haven't done these things, it's almost in your benefit to not do them if you're planning to sell it because you will never make back your your return on these things, right? You know, if you're planning on doing it and then you've just done it, then great. But if you, you know, if you don't have something like uh, FCP Euro's return policy, if you don't have these parts already uh, purchased, ready to go, I would say it's not really worth it for you to buy these parts, install them yourself, or have a shop install them if you don't have some sort of good pricing on these things, because you'll never make back that money. It's just plain and simple. Um, it's almost like if you're if you're about to sell a house and you do home renovations three months before you sell the house, you're never going to make back your principal on whether it be cabinets, hardwood, paint, the time for the uh, the permits, for the professionals to come in and do the things to the house that you need done. You know, unless it's something very very critical like the water pump, then or like the O2 sensor because it won't pass smog, then yes, you do those things before you sell right but if it's not critical for the car to run to pass smog just let it go just let it go let them negotiate you down i would say bump up your price just a little bit let them bring you down and then settle that's the best way to go so you know one is going to be that we're coming back to reality two is going to be the service cost of all of these items whether it be you know diy or you take it into a shop and then the third is we have two points to this, and that is going to be when BMW jumps from their LCI models to their pre-LCI model, uh, models, as well as when they do a facelift. So here we can see that we have the uh, the G87 versus the F87 here. So when BMW comes out with a new model, it outdates the previous model. So you know when you're within an, an and F87, you know, before the G87 came out, you might not see that big of a decrease from the previous years. Um, you will see a bigger decrease once the LCI model rolls out. So kind of like their, their facelift of the current generation. You will see a decrease in there because there is an upgrade in things like tech and, you know, how the engine runs and all of those things. And there is always going to be a... a a decline or a depreciation of the model within itself uh, over time. But as soon as this new model comes out, you know, LCI a little bit, you know, complete redesign in this case, going to a different generation, huge difference in price. Um, even if these two cars are separated by one year. Um, so like, let's just say this is a, uh, 20 i think what is so, so let's just say this is 2023 this is a 2022 this will have a bigger difference in price versus this 2022 model and the 2021 model within the same generation so that's another way that you could pick it up is if there's a new generation out go for the previous one because that's where you're going to be able to save a little, a little bit more money um, and it's not just you know styling aspects of the car right it's not just you know it, it looks cool or whatever but little things like the parking sensors or whatnot and uh you know the lights you know could have been from halogen to led uh for the tail lights that here the parking sensors are going to you know have more tech in it it's going to be more accurate 
and all the things. Also, too, is usually things like tires are wider, rotors are larger, things like that uh, you'll see on the outside. So it's not just a, a redesign. A lot of it is, but there are some components that are more expensive on the exterior. We see a huge difference when we jump into the interior. So, you know, uh, F chassis on the left, G chassis on the right, and we can see that there's a huge redesign within the seats. Uh, some of the center console stuff is generally very, very similar. But when we jump into like the driver's seat, we're met with a completely different screen, right? So, uh, you know, like we have like this huge infotainment screen on the G chassis and then on the Fs, you know, we have our typical speedometer, it's, uh, odometer right here, and then a smaller screen here, albeit, you know, pretty good for, for what it is. But still, you know, if you're thinking like TVs, computers, you know, bigger screens always cost more, right? There's more tech involved with this because it's kind of like a split screen versus these two, you know, this is like an analog thing and this is a digital thing. Um, you know, we have more carbon fiber, you know, and, you know, debate for how expensive that is because BMW does do it in house. Um, but you know, the, most of the tech I would say is like in the seats, some of it in the steering wheel because the steering wheel is kind of like fancier. It has more controls on it. So it's, it does have more tech. Um, here's just a different angle of the bigger screen comparing the two chassis. Uh, personally, I like, for me, simple is better. So I actually do like the F chassis steering wheel more. I like the analog gauges to be honest with you. However, I like that the screen on the G chassis is like it's lower, right? So your field of view through the windshield is more clear. Um, at least when I've when I've sat in one of them, it's more clear than having that little bump like this. If you're if you're parking, say like you're in a and going grocery shopping and you're parking in a slot that has like that little cement um, slab at the end, if you're parking in the front and you have a front lip and you're trying to like see how much space you have, um, because sometimes the, the, uh, parking sensor doesn't pick up that, that piece that's so low to the ground. Um, this screen can get in the way, right? If you're trying to like, say for example, uh, parallel park and you're trying to see how close you are to the curb, uh, in the front, this screen can get in the way. So I do like the, you know, I like the, that the fact that they brought the screen down in the newer cars, I just prefer the, the analog gauges is all. Um, but again, you know, still that costs more money. You know, there's more carbon, carbon fiber here and there's more plastic here. Um, Honestly, I don't think it really costs them all that much more because BMW does their plastics and carbon fiber in-house. Like they have their own manufacturing plant that makes them. So their, their real cost for this is mostly like the raw materials and the labor they pay their people to make this. They're not really outsourcing this from anywhere. So they're making a huge profit off of this stuff because they are the direct producers of the item. So there's no middleman or middle company involved to take away their profits. And we, we all know that if you buy any interior replacement carbon fiber piece, it's almost always cheaper than what BMW charges, right? You, you can talk about Denman. I think some places like ECS is coming out with some of their own stuff. Still, BMW is more expensive. So, you know, I would argue that when they say, oh, you get all this carbon fiber stuff and all that, it's not, it's not like it's really expensive for them to make at this point. Now, the last point that we have up here, and we'll open up for Q and A after this, uh, really depends on it. So like these, these three points, right? The fact that, uh, we're coming back to reality, the fact that it's, you know, we have high maintenance, especially dropping off on the second order. I think the best value is like second owner repairs everything or whatever they don't own it for all that long and then the third owner takes it the third owner gets a really good value here because they get a car that's been depreciated the second owner kind of took on all the burden 
of fixing it and and doing all the repairs and all that stuff and then the third owner just like kind of rides off into the sunset almost right um so i would say that it's coming back to reality doing the maintenance and then also when we're going up to different generations getting newer tech those are the like the three key components that are going to be consistent no matter where you are no matter what your financial situation is no matter what car you're looking at all three of those things will play a factor in dropping the price of bmws and it doesn't mean that the bmw is bad it just means that that's just how things are and that's how they've always been excluding the last five years the thing that will depend on is if you need a loan so if you're buying the car for you know buying cash or whatnot this doesn't really apply to you the loan process can also drive the price down of older cars to a certain extent and what i mean by that is when we were looking at the newer chassis right if we have a comparison here of newer you, this is an old estimate but um you can exclude the payment here because you know bmws are a little bit more expensive than this on a monthly payment but if we just look at the percentages uh you'll see that used cars do have a higher annual percentage rate and on the bottom here we can see that it says you know some lenders charge higher rates for used cars because you can't take advantage of manufactured deals you know so if you're buying an electric car you have a state federal rebate that type of stuff um, sometimes they're running a promotion at the at the dealership or whatever so those are the deals they're referring to and because it's difficult to determine the actual value of a of a used car because again has it been serviced are there modifications um is something broken so there are all those inconsistencies that can throw off the value of a used car you know a 20 uh, a 2012 f30 is not going to be the same across the board for every 2012 f30 used car buyers also default at a higher rate causing some lenders to charge more in interest to make up for missed profits so essentially um it's kind of like when people steal things from a store the people who end up purchasing actual like going to the store and and buying whatever they want um end up paying higher prices because of the theft and the loss the store is trying to recoup that from people who are trying to do the right thing i don't think that that's right i think it should be dealt with on an individual basis basically if you have good credit if you're making your payments you should pay what you know your actions reflect if you're late on payments if you miss payments then yes of course that should reflect as well but if you're thinking about this too is um new vehicles probably the loan rate is probably longer right so it could be five years six years something like that used vehicles depending on the price if we're talking like a twenty thousand dollar car a fifteen thousand dollar car maybe you're only you only need a loan for three to four years so dealerships what they'll do is they'll say okay you know what we know that you're looking at these two cars the used one and the new one we can get you a lower rate on the new one because we're going to do all of these things for you and they they do this because they have you in the loan for longer so their total net profit is larger right so the apr is lower however they're they're applying this lower percentage rate to a higher principle so the the sell point of the car is higher and also the term is longer so they're getting a larger profit potentially per year and over over the entire span of the contract so that's why they can afford to give you a lower percentage rate and also it depends right sometimes if you get a new car some of these dealerships they have their own banking right so like bmw has their own bank Fidity has their own bank you don't necessarily have to go to like wells fargo chase or or bank of america or anything like that to get a loan sometimes what these dealerships will, will do is what when they say okay let me go to the back and and see what i can do with my manager typically what they're doing is they'll run it across you know the the normal banks they'll come back and say this is what you have 
then you say, I need some time to think about it. And they say, okay, hang on, let me go to the back and let me run it again. They get you another sweep of banks. If you don't like those, maybe they'll go back one more time. And then the third sweep of all the banks will include their specific bank. And they'll say something like, oh, well, it takes us time because, you know, we do this all in house. You know, we're, we're not a, a big institution. We only finance our stuff. So it takes a little bit longer for us. They make up some, some, some trash reason. Um, but essentially what they do is they, they see what the rates are from the other banks. And the, usually the first batch is, um, it's kind of like a balancing act for them, right? So say for example, if you default on the loan, then that dealership and the manufacturer BMW in this case would take the entire hit. But just say, for example, they finance it out to Bank of America and Bank of America is willing to give them a commission. And the commission is something along the lines of 60 to 70% of what they would get if they did it in house. BMW is willing to take that 60 or 70% with virtually no responsibility or backlash as far as if you default, because what Bank of America, what they might arrange on the back end with Bank of America is you will give us our commission all up front. Like, doesn't matter whether whether they default on the loan, doesn't matter, you know, um, if they finish the loan, if they sell the car, whatever, you give us our cut up front all at once for the total of the contract. That's something that we don't necessarily know, but that's something that they can negotiate with their banks. So usually the first slate of banks that they bring you, it's, it's the balancing act of, these banks will give us the higher um, commission rate, but it's also very, very, very low risk for us to take on. You know, the second set of banks, maybe they give them a 40 or 50% commission, um, or it's something along the lines of, we'll give you 40% and we'll give you everything up front. So still relatively low risk. The third one is like, okay, we'll give you the loan. We'll take the risk. Let's just get it done, right? So... Um, for all of these reasons, we might, you know, the cars can, uh, can go down and it doesn't mean that the car is bad in itself, but it's just something to be aware of that we're coming back to reality. These cars are expensive to maintain. Um, new models are coming out all the time. And, um, depending on how you're going to pay for the car, all these things can play an effect on the car's pricing. So it's not necessarily that the, it's a bad thing. Um, just do your research, you know, ask the right questions on what's the service history on the car, what's been done on the car, you know, not all aftermarket modifications are necessarily a good thing, right? So now we'll open it up for our Q and a Alejandro here says he doesn't know why the prices are dropping, but he loves it. It looks like you're in a, in the market for it. What, um, what car are you in the market for Greg? Hey Fritz, mentioned in your last live video about the XHP software tune for the transmission. All right, forgot it only applied to automatic cars. Oh, okay, that, that, that makes sense, right? Because manuals, it's up to us to to push it or not, or how fast or how slow we want to shift. Car snob, because they all leak oil, even newer ones. Uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Uh, if you guys saw that my short video that I had today. I have a small leak in the rear portion of my valve cover gasket. And um, I wouldn't say like it's critical. Like it's it's not leaking profusely. I'm not, it doesn't necessarily trip off my oil gauge. Um, but it is something that I want to film. Like if it's something that I didn't want to film, I can just knock it out in a weekend. But because it's something that I do want to film, um, I probably won't have time to address it until next month actually. So it's actually fine because my dad's on on vacation. He's actually in the Philippines. So I'm actually rotating between uh, the F30 in this car. So, um, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, depending on what leak it is. I would say that the valve cover gasket works out because when it leaks, it, it drips onto the down pipe and it just kind of burns off. So it does leave a smell. However, I would say that that's a safer leak to, to wait to do versus the oil filter housing gasket and the oil cooler gasket, because that can leak onto your serpentine belt could cause it to slip off and then, you know, boom, there goes your water pump. There goes your AC, your alternator, all the things that make the car run. And 
cool. So I would say that that's one that you really shouldn't wait on, right? Uh, but yeah, Car Snob, you're absolutely correct. Dartuga. Just a matter of preventive maintenance. Fritz has some great vids for that. Oh, okay, right on. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. XHP tune. Tell me more. Um, I think it just kind of changes the ratio in which, like, I, I've never used it. I think he's motorsports has a good video on it. Um, but essentially I guess it's, it's like, it can make the car shift faster or it could, um, wait for the, for the RPMs to dial up more. That's essentially the, all that is. It just changes the point in which the transmission shifts. And I'm sure that if it's a tune, like you could have it to be like something where it's like fuel efficient and then something that's really like driving aggressive. Let's see what else we have here. Truth is treason said, just sold my M235i after I took care of it meticulously. It still seized up at 145,000 miles and cost me a motor. I have had five BMWs and finally got a Tesla because the car was always broken. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, oh, well, I hope you enjoy your Tesla. Um, I'm actually interested. You know, I've I've driven a couple of Teslas before. Um, it's cool. Like the tech inside is cool. Um, the power creep, as far as like how fast it is accelerate, it's it's kind of it takes a while to get used to. Just because it's like you don't hear like the sound of an engine, you don't feel the shift of the transmission. You're it just winds up and just keeps going and going and going, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I'm going this fast. Um, one thing I was like really surprised about is like the model three. So the smaller car, it handles like a much bigger car. Um, I would say like it handles more like a three or a five series, um, with its turning radius, its ability to like corner a turn, take a turn. Um, on the flip side, it's be and this is because the batteries on the bottom, that's probably why the turning radius isn't so good. The model Y, so like the bigger cars, they handle like a much smaller car because most of the weight is at the bottom because of the battery. So it's very planted, those bigger cars, albeit you, you know, you have a glass sunroof or anything, everything, you have that panoramic roof, but you compare it to like another SUV, you know, similar build and, and nature, uh, that model Y is going to handle much better than you expect it to. I would argue that it, handles you know probably like the turning radius isn't all that good but it handles much better than what you would expect um so it's kind of like reverse like the small cars don't handle like the way that you think the in a bad way and the bigger cars don't handle in a way that you think in a good way so depending on which one you got well actually regardless of which one you got i hope you enjoy it um and um if you ever go get back into bmws i, I wish you better luck next time Jim, how's it going? People are afraid to work on their own vehicles. I would say like, I, you know, I, I keep hearing things like that. And it's surprising to me because you would think that now that we live in an age where there's like YouTube, uh, people are able to do like detailed forum posts because it's so easy to take high quality pictures with your phone. You don't need like a point and shoot anymore. The camera technology in our phones is so much better. Um, there's so many things on like social media places like Turner are releasing instruction manuals. There's just so much more information available to fix your car correctly. And also like tool manufacturers, right? Before it's like snap on or bust, you know, like when you're talking like, you know, my daddy's in his seventies, my grandfather, he's, he's, he's passed on, but like, you know, he would be well into his hundreds by now, but you know, in, in those days, it's like snap on or bust and it's, it's expensive. You know, maybe my dad started, you know, when he was younger, maybe things like Husky started to come up, but now we have things like gear wrench, tech, and Olsa tools. Um, there's this other brand that's pretty interesting. Aries tools, all of these, you know, and Harbor freight has upped their game so much. So it's not just that the, the information is more available, but the tools are more accessible, right? Like even if you get like the cheap Pittsburgh stuff at Harbor Freight, that stuff carries a lifetime warranty 
and Harbor Freight is more accessible than it has ever been before. So more than likely, you could just go and return it. Lowe's, Home Depot, their warranties lifetime, right? So you just walk into the store if you don't have a Harbor Freight near you and boom, Tecton, if you don't have any of if you live in the middle of nowhere, Tecton will mail it to you. There are so many options for the knowledge of how to work on the car, as well as access to the tools to work on the car. Um, so it's kind of sad to see. It's kind of like, you know, when you're blessed with an opportunity, you don't take it. And then, you know, you see these people who don't have the same opportunity, like thriving, um, you know, small tangent, but it's almost like, um, uh, you know, I hear it all the time. Cause you know, like my, my parents, they immigrated here and they're like, Oh, your generation is, is so lazy. Like when we were here, we didn't have the internet. We had to walk to school. Um, you know, we didn't have computers. We had to do everything by hand. We didn't have calculators. And it's amazing. Honestly, it, it truly is to see like that generation and what they were able to achieve. And, you know, looking at, at my generation, it's like, we have, we have no excuse, you know, especially comparing it to them, no excuse as to why we can't succeed. And I feel like cars, uh, Jim, like what you're saying, it's true. I just wish it wasn't true because it's never been easier to work on cars than it is today. Even tuning, right? Like scan tools are more available, right? Uh, you can do like things through apps through your phone. It's amazing. Oh, and Jim has some in input here on the X XHP tune. Uh, he says that uh, since his uh, manual okay, right, he says at the gym. Oh my goodness, clever, clever. That is true, and I will say I'm I'm right-handed, so everything like you know, like bench press, dumbbell, you know curls, all the things. I'm always stronger on my right side with the exception to single leg items, right? Single leg workouts. And, and like Jim, I also do drive a manual. So I noticed that like, you know, my right arm is bigger than my left arm, but my left calf is like, like dwarfs my right calf. And it's evident in the workouts. Like sometimes I can do like three or four more reps on my right arm. Like when, my right leg kicks out. Like I try to do like single leg calf raises, standing calf raises, like um, whether it be on dumbbells, you know, barbells, Smith machine, you name it. Um, like my right leg can give out at like 10. And like my left just keeps chugging along like way past 20 reps, depending on what it is that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Jim there. Soul Slinger, how's it going? I hope you had a good commute today. Hope your weekend was well, my friend. I would agree. Most people do jobs. Oh, I would agree. Most people I do jobs for won't try it because they're intimidated. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes it just looks tedious, right? But it's not hard, right? You just have to be meticulous. I would say like grab like one of those silicone pads or like, I think it's called like grip them or whatever. They're making a lot of knockoff stuff on, on, Amazon, get a, a, get a lot of those magnetic parts trays from Arbor Freight for a dollar. Um, I would say a lot of the stuff now is just being meticulous and being organized. So in addition to getting the tools, you know, just don't leave them on top of the radiator shroud type of thing in the, in the engine bay or whatever, or don't leave it on the vanity cover type of thing. Um, you know, have a, like have like a little parts container or something like that. Keep it organized. You can get the little magnetic ones that are like different colors. Uh, I mean, Soul Slinger is a, is a professional mechanic. So, I mean, I'd be interested on in his take care, but I feel that in order to get rid of some of the intimidation, just be willing to be a little bit more organized and, and just get those bigger trays or whatever. Or you can use like the cardboard box or whatever that your parts come in. Like that's acceptable too. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but as long as you keep all your nuts and bolts in, in line, um, take it step by step, take it slow and, um, you'll be fine. No need to rush. You know, you'll get it done. We all, we all started from somewhere you know, I was, you know, I, I make it look good on camera, you know, but it took me a long time to get there. Right. Um, you know, like even if something is like rotating tires, like I, I didn't know about the star pattern at one point. Right. Uh, we all start from somewhere. So don't, don't feel intimidated by anybody online. I'll be the first one to tell you, um, you know, 
I made dumb mistakes. You know, we all do. It's just part of the learning process. Be grace, graceful with yourself to allow yourself to learn, right? You don't need to be an expert. It doesn't matter what any of your friends say or, or whatever, right? They all had to learn as well. We're not just born inherently as, as a master mechanic as Soul Singer. I'm sure Soul Singer will, will tell you too because he's very humble. Um, just be graceful with yourself and allow yourself to learn. And, you know, you have the support of, of myself and other people here in, in the community. Jim, M2, go for the previous all day, right? A new one is fugly dead. Horse beaten. Ah, uh, you said it all right there, man. I don't need to, I don't need to add on that, but yes, yes. Everything you said, I second that. Can I, can I like that? I don't know how this, you know, I've actually, okay, well, I'm telling you, I like, I like the comment. The screen on the G chassis actually feels pretty solid. Uh, still too much. Yes. I think overall it just, it's not as good. Um, I like, like I said, I like the digital stuff. I just like that. It, it gives you a better field of view through the windshield. Um, if you were able to deliver that in the F chassis with the F chassis screen, then I would still prefer the F chassis. Um, I guess if I'm being really nitpicky, I guess like the little bump of the, of the traditional, uh, odometer and speedometer if they could find a way to lower that as well that'd be nice um but i mean that's something that's always been like classic bmw so i guess i've just been used to it um but i do like that the bigger that the newer screen gives you a better field of actual field of view um but i agree it's, it's a bit over the top for for what it is soul slinger you should do a video on how much a person would need to earn to buy a new versus used based on average rent, bills, etc. Also have to compensate for average cost per year to service. Ooh, okay. That's a technical one. I I can get to work on that. Uh, that'll take me a while. So I have a few uh, videos in the pipeline, a uh, few things with suspension. Um I would like to do that actually. I mean, just based off of my work, I mean, that's a fascinating, you know what? Give me a second. I'm going to screenshot that. I like that one. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I like that one. I think that would really help service the community. That's a good one. Thanks, man. Jim, your video earlier today helped me diagnose a bad PCV valve. Thought I had a boost leak. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Good. Good thing that you found out that it was there instead of uh, somewhere else. Um, I mean, that's not technically a boost leak on the F30 with my dad's car. Um, it was the turbo inlet pipe. So from the intake to the turbo. So I guess it's just a, a, a leak because it's not post turbo. So it's not, uh, classified as a boost leak, but, um, yeah, I mean, depending on what you have on your car, I almost would have preferred you to have a boost leak because if it's something like from the charge pipe and it's just the pipes are misaligned with the silicone coupler. That's just something that you kind of just like wiggle back in place and snap it back in. Um, so I would have almost preferred you to have a boost leak if that was the cause of it, because that'll take you like two minutes and, and you're done versus needing a valve cover. I do wish that we had a manufacturer who is willing to say like, do maybe a metal valve cover and somehow have that PCV piece external so that if it goes bad, we only need to service it. Um, Soul Slinger, I don't know if you're in your experience, you know of a piece like that. Um, because it seems like almost a waste and such a hassle to just have that portion that's mounted on the valve cover go bad. And then you need to replace the entire valve cover, which is so tedious and say, for example, it goes bad, a, you know, a few thousand miles after you replace a gasket, that means you need a new gasket. Um, it's so tedious. Um, but I'm glad to, to hear that it helped you today, Jim. Dartuga. Did my valve cover gas, did my valve cover gasket a little while ago. The white smoke was a bit concerning, pretty easy. Just the bolts near the firewall that are tricky. Yeah. That part is um is tricky. It's it's such a tight clearance there. It's almost like you need uh it's almost it, usually I, I prefer to work with three eighths drive, but 
there you're definitely going to want hopefully you can find a quarter inch e-torque set and then just use a quarter inch extension to get in there um, same thing you're going to need the torque wrench quarter inch for that if i'm not mistaken that's actually another positive for the g chassis the the engine bay it's not necessarily bigger but they give you more working space towards the back end of the block from i mean i haven't worked on them but from just like observing it and i've i've actually stuck my hand in there it feels like there's more space to work in uh so that is a pro of the g chassis is um like say for example you need to do like um spark plugs or ignition coils it's not like with the f chassis now where you gotta like you know rip off like all the back coverings and all the strut tower strut bracing and all that um the g chassis it seems like it's easier to work with with in that in that regard um so less time consuming at the very least jim been watching valve cover replacement videos all day instead of working uh there's another guy there he's like a pro mechanic um um very knowledgeable it sounds like um uh, you'll know he uh, when he opens up the car it's a very very dusty f30 he does it and then there's this other uh um i forget her name it's something like lady mechanic or or something like that she has an m235i specifically so uh the the fuel rail attaches slightly differently from the f22 than it does on the f30 and so uh, i think she just has a few additional tips on how to how to attack that um but I, th I think you combine those and it's a very good video um as well as you know like fcp euro and and ecs they they're always you know they're always good so um but yeah i can i can definitely relate to that because i've been looking that thing up i'm like okay as soon as i get my days off from work and i can film this i'm I'm going to do it, but I need to research it as well. The biggest thing is the torque sequence or the tightening sequence um, because there's so many bolts. There's like 30 some odd bolts and they need to go in, in sequence. That's the hardest part. Dartuga, I'm wanting to do my oil filter housing gasket now. Okay. Well, I mean, if you don't have a leak, there's no need to rush it. But the moment that, it, that you do get it, um, go ahead and attack it. Hopefully my video is able to help you out with that. If um, keys is also good. I mean, I, I piggyback off of his when I made that video. Um, who else has a pretty good one? The the hard thing is, I forget who else I watched. Um, I think FCP Euro. I mean, you combine those two. I think that's that's really all that I did to make that video. Everyone else was kind of like anecdotal, like this bolt was hard to get to. Here's how I fixed it. You know, this thing is hard to tighten. So here's how I got around it. Um, so I still recommend like watching all of them to pick up that information. Um, and I hope it goes well for you. Jim, Euroshop wants, that's basically 1659. So basically 1660 to replace the valve cover. I think I'm going to try the $20 Dremel repair. Let me know how that works. Um, I've, I've heard about it. I haven't looked into depth about it, but um, yeah, I mean, honestly, if it goes bad, like if it's already bad, right? What, what's the harm, right? If it's already bad, it's already bad. There's no harm in, I would say like buying the valve cover doing the 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 dremel repair if it works it works you could eventually you're going to need to replace it anyway so you you at least have the valve cover for when the time comes and then say for example the the repair doesn't work you have the valve cover ready to go and you only messed up at worst a valve cover that was already messed up um but i do hope that it goes in your favor i mean worst case scenario like i said it's not all that bad um to at least give it a try I'm, and I'd be interested to to hear what you, um, what comes of it. Is this reckless car? Is that what it's supposed to be? How's it going? 
My coolant overflow line broke last week. Thankfully, BMW had it in stock. Yeah, honestly, any reputable shop, any BMW dealership, they have a ton of those in stock. They might say something along the lines of like, oh, we only have a few more. No, I've been to a lot of shops. I've poked my head into, you know, like some of the service departments at, at, at BMW. They have a ton of these. Like this is one of the things that they will almost never run out of. I would say like this and oil filters. They're not running out of this. Like they know that that's how bad of an issue this is. Like when, when there's like five of these remaining, they're going to order more. They never want to be like on their last one. I mean, maybe worst case scenario is like, like a shipment is late, right? Maybe it's supposed to arrive on Friday. It doesn't come on Friday and it's a, it's a holiday on Monday. And say, for example, you know, that weekend, a bunch of people say, okay, I'm going to repair my car and they buy a bunch of them. Maybe then they would be low. It's extremely rare though. I'm glad to hear that you got it fixed though. That thing always breaks. Mine broke uh, a while back as well. So you're not alone. And Jim is saying that damn line broke when they were prepping my car at the dealership when I bought it. Luckily, they also had it in stock. So I got it new. <laughs> right on. Said just bought a 2014 328i xDrive with the N26 engine right on. Right away, had to replace the valve cover gasket, oil filter, and oil cooler gaskets, and the engine belt and tensioner with 76,000 miles. Any other surprise? Um, the N26, if I'm not mistaken, should have been a Sulev. The, depending on like, so when you say right away, um, I would say like the valve cover, like these gaskets is only, it's like something that you can very easily negotiate off the bat because it leaks, it's super evident. It should have been something that you negotiated or, I mean, my, my nephew just bought a car not too long ago. His valve cover was leaking. I told him, I said, take that thing right back to the dealership and tell me you need to repair it. Or you're going to write, you're going to write a terrible review for them. Right. Um, I also told him like, you know, like if, if they give you trouble, like, you know, I will try to get the word out that they sold you a car knowing that it went through the you know, 150 million point inspection. And there's a, a huge valve cover leak through your rear shock is leaking. They still didn't want to replace it. Um, and I was like, this is, is unacceptable, right? They said, I think for his rear shock, they said, oh, there's fluid coming out, but it's not leaking. When I went with him to do the, to the dealership to have all these things serviced, I was like, did you just say, that fluid is coming out, but it's not leaking. Like, how does that make sense? Like you can't, fluid cannot come out unless there is a leak. <laughs> that is like the definition of a leak. Um, as far as your car, I would say your Mickey Mouse flange when you do the coolant. Anything related to your turbo, anything emissions related, you should be covered by your Sulev warranty. So turbo catalytic converter. Um, if I'm not mistaken, like your PCV system, anything related on that, uh, you can go to keys motor, look, go on YouTube, search keys, motorsports, Sulev in the description of his video. He's got a link. It'll take you to like, your certain production model and it'll tell you what's covered underneath your Sulev car. Um, you shouldn't really need to do too much to it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the timing chain guide is also covered on some of those cars. I would say that's the other thing that you have to worry about, but if you're lucky, it's covered. Reckless car. I was surprised it didn't happen sooner. 85,000 miles. Honestly, it could happen any time, you know, like what Jim said is like, you put a little pressure on that thing and boom. Um, yeah, it's not something that necessarily like will just break on its own because it's like such a low pressure system. It's kind of like you accidentally lean on it. You put a tool on it while you're working there. You accidentally like put the vanity cover on it, something like that, right? It catches on something that's kind of like when it breaks. 
Jim, that clutch delay valve delete helps with the left calf raises. <laughs> oh my goodness. Right on, man. Absolutely. Jim, you don't need parts trays. All engines need a couple 10 millimeter sockets lost. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my. Yeah. The good old 10 mil. I guess that's exactly why like Harbor Freight and like you see all these other tool manufacturers coming out with like their uh, 10 socket, 10 millimeter socket uh, tray or whatever that has like impact, chrome, swivel, uh, magnetic, you know, short, stubby, medium. They have their whole thing. It's because that thing always like grows legs and ends up walking away. Jim. Back to the PCV video you did earlier. Use my mighty vac and mine wouldn't hold pressure. Mm. Leads me to believe the bladder in the valve is bad. Started when I moved to stage two flash from MHD. Oh. Okay. I wonder if other people have the same issue. Let's see. I have an aluminum valve cover, but seemed too cheap. Apparently, previous engines you could replace just the PCV. Huh. Uh, for my knowledge, it's it's in there for the plastic ones. Um, I haven't used the metal one. I mean, the Vargas one, it's weird. It says like it's S55 and N55, but when I look on um, Extreme Powerhouse's website in their uh, Q&A section, it says that it won't fit the N55. I was interested in picking one of those up, but um, after seeing that, I'm not too sure. Um, I have seen the other ones on ECS's website, but my uh, my shop guys over at SV Bimmer, they said that the problem with a lot of these aftermarket valve covers is that they don't hold vacuum. Um, so maybe you're experiencing the same thing. Um, if you don't mind, what brand is that? Soul Singer. They integrated the PCV into most valve covers on different models. I did an engine swap on a 5.4 liter F-150 a few months ago. I ran into this problem. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why it is integrated. That there's no way. I mean, they, they put enough R&D into their engineering and research. Why it couldn't be, like, still attached to it, right? So, but, but, like, able to be serviced separate of the valve cover. Right? Let's see. We basically replaced both of the new engine. Oh my goodness. It become an, it's becoming a non-service support. Yeah. I don't, I have no idea what, I don't know if it's like, it's more prone to failure. It, it doesn't hold as well. I mean, there's gotta be a reason or they just want more money. Let's see. Girly garage does the valve cover video. Okay. There it is right on. Thanks for sharing that. Both valve covers on the new engine. On the new engine. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I feel like it's just a money grab at this point. That link is the PCV fix. Worth a try versus the parts and labor. Okay, yeah. I'll definitely check that out. I don't have aluminum cover. Just saw it online today, but it was like 200. I don't trust it. Um... Yeah, a lot of people online are saying it's like it'll fit, right? It'll fit. It the the gasket will fit onto the thing. Like you you run it, you won't have an oil leak. It's holding vacuum that's the issue. So yeah. Um as far as I can tell, like OEM is probably the best shot that we have for the time being. So saying your money, they want the monies. Uh, I feel like that's what it always is, right? Um, you know, I think like Ford is going to their, they want to do something similar to Tesla where Tesla sells direct to consumer versus going through a dealership and all that. Um, and I think a lot of car manufacturers, they do want to do that, right? They don't want to go through car dealerships anymore. A lot of them are blaming like the, uh, the supply and demand thing from 2020 being the issue, but it's like, it's kind of your guys' fault for like not having the supply. It's not necessarily the fact that you had supply and you couldn't bring it into the dealerships to sell to the customer. It's the fact that you, 
there just wasn't anything there to sell from dealership or directly from you. And so potentially this is a reason for BMW. I mean, it's the Mickey Mouse flange thing is like, is like all the proof that you need. Like that thing has been an issue for so long and they've never fixed it. So that's all the proof that uh, I think we need to say that, yeah, they don't, they don't really care about making the cars more serviceable. They just want our money. So Soul Singer, I think you're right. Uh, Jim, I am act, I'm very interested to see how things turn out for you with the valve cover. Um, I'll do a little research on that, uh, that Dremel repair myself and see. Um, I hope I don't need to use it because mine is still holding vacuum, but um, in the event that I run into that issue, by the time I'm ready to do the valve cover, um, give it a shot. Like I said, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, I'm only getting noise when giving throttle. Don't want to put it off too long and blow out the rear seal. Or I'll, I'll report back on the cheap fix. Looking forward to it, man. Soul Singer, I'm a mechanical engineer myself, so I can see what they're doing with the newer vehicles. It's shady underhand garbage. Okay. I try to give them benefit of the doubt, but, um, you know, this isn't my area of expertise and I will always defer to your insight. So, um, I guess giving them the benefit of the doubt is not, is not the correct thing to do in this situation, uh, because I would never go against your better judgment, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, you know, they're already getting a lot of money from us. They charge like $300. I mean, shop price is like $300 at an hour, uh, at least here in the Bay area. You know, some people are saying like 200 is a lot from where they're at. That's like what independent shops charge here. So yeah, prices are not going down. Um, inflation is, is hurting us, but, um, you know, that's what we have, have a community for, right? My O2... Uh, 540i has a PCV integrated into the intake manifold and it is serviceable. <laughs> so it's like they do this stuff intentional. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, we had a great thing before, but how can we get more money? I mean, also too, they should be considered of their own techs, right? Like their techs are going to be the one that have to do this. And so it's like, could you just bust out a bunch of these in once versus like in the same time that it takes to do one valve cover, right? So it's like, you're kind of like drawing out one job to like squeeze all the money you can out of one client versus like, all right, we'll just pop these out like nothing. Um, I said, I mean, like if you look at like Lamborghini and Ferrari and you compare it to Toyota, Toyota is still a more profitable business because they hit that volume, right? If you got a hot commodity and you can sell a lot of it, like, Volume is what makes you money. I mean, it's, I mean, like Walmart's a big company. Um, so it's like, it's a good model. I don't know why these other companies, they like, oh, let's just squeeze the, the customer for all we can. Uh, so saying I took it off and replaced the guts. I wish, yeah, I wish ours were like the newer ones were more like that. Thanks, bro. Always good content on the channel. Uh, club needs to, I think it's a tour club needs to stick together. That's right. Yeah, there's so few of us here. Yeah. Oh, so interested to see. Yeah, let me know. Uh, D guy. Hey, Fritz, you know a good BMW mechanic in San Diego area? I do not. I think the farthest south I go is like Precision Dynamics. They're almost like a, they're not necessarily like a sister company, but they are, you know, they know each other, right? Precision Dynamics and SUV, they do know each other. Um, send me a DM on, on Instagram and um, I'll see what I can find for you. I'll try to post a story or something and share the results of what people have. Jim, hopefully, oh, talking about replacing the guts. Hopefully that's what I end up doing in the end. I have faith. Tour. Good save looking at the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm not one of those people that can completely like not look at the keyboard and, and type. Uh I do I do need to cheat every once in a while. Um 
So yeah, I hope it all works out. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your input. Everybody who came in, Jim, uh, interested to see what we get back from it. Soul Singer, thank you so much for your insight as always. And, um, you know, also letting us know that, uh, they're, they're kind of giving us the business when they integrate it like that. Uh, D guy, thanks man. Keep up the quality content. I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so with that, we've been on here for uh, a little over an hour now. Um, thank you everybody who's been hanging out. If you have any other questions, any other topic suggestions, go ahead and send me a DM on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok as well at VroomTuber. Hope all of you have a good day and enjoy the rest of your week. And I will see you next Tuesday.